I hope you had a I hope everyone had a good lunch and um, welcome to this uh, incredibly important panel. This panel is really about uh, how we're going to revive growth. Uh, last year growth was uh, around 3%. Uh, this year we're expecting around 2.8. That's a lot lower than the trend growth during the last two decades. We've been close to 4%. And that delta is not insignificant. That delta means that uh, poverty is growing uh, many places in the world, and uh, we also see increased uh, youth unemployment. So as you see, the theme of this um, panel is uh, without uh, trade and investment recovery, there is no real recovery. And there is a need for a trade recovery. Uh, I mentioned the trend growth of the global economy, 3.8, and now we are 2.8 uh, or 3. Point, uh, or 2.9. Trade last year was 0 0.8 growth. And uh, in the past, when we had higher growth, trade was the engine behind the growth. Trade was growing much faster than the economy. How do we revive um, trade and investment growth? But how do we also make sure that we factor in that it works for the environment, it works for jobs, and it works also for less inequalities? I think that's important. But also trade is changing so fast. Today, digital trade is 15% of the global trade. It's growing double as fast as the rest of the trade area. Services are growing also much faster than traditional goods. But then we have industry policies suddenly injected into that. And uh, as Dr. Engos and I discussed at uh, the luncheon when we went to grad school in economics, we learned that uh, industry policy was not a good idea. <laughs> That has uh, changed uh, a bit, so we are pragmatic, but uh, how pragmatic should we be about that? Then we have level playing fields. We have it now with the electrical vehicles, the EVs, so we have it in many areas. So geopolitics is worse than last year. The economy is maybe a little bit better than we expected. Soft landing in the US, maybe, hopefully. Uh, inshallah. Uh, but that also means that um, we are very concerned about the geopolitical aspect of this. And we are already seeing it on the supply chains. What is happening now in the Red Sea, for example? And if you want to move in a situation where inflation goes down, I think we also have to factor in the need for competition and comparative advantages. Hopefully you have not forgotten all about that. And then we have the MC13. What does that mean? We have important trade minister meeting in February under the auspices of the WTO. And uh, Dr. Uh, Ngozi, um, I think your trade growth numbers for this year, fortunately, are better than last year, a lot better. But I know you have some concerns. And also thank you for being the guardian of the trade rules we have today, because we are not in a trade recession. Trade is still growing. Sometimes you get the different feeling when you read the newspapers. Mm -hmm. But it's growing, but it's not growing as fast as we want. So how can we secure what we have? How can we develop it also into the new areas that are growing? And how can we secure that trade again becomes an engine for growth? Easy questions. Very easy. <laughs> in three minutes. Well, thank you, Boga. Um, you're right. Last year, well, we saw weak growth in trade. We predicted, uh, projected 0.8 percent, and uh, we had a slight rebound in the last quarter of last year on, in automobiles and parts and components. But I don't think it's enough to really make us change our numbers very much. But going into this year, we were more optimistic, and we projected 3.3 percent. But the concerns about what is happening uh, in the Red Sea uh, and, and the Suez Canal, and elsewhere in the world. People also forget that climate change concerns, drought in the Panama Canal, are also uh, an issue. And uh, so this uncertainty 
that we have and the downgrade of global growth. So it also has an impact on trade. So trade, it's like a circular thing, impacts global growth and, and back. Makes us less, slightly less optimistic about the 3.3%. I think we'll come in below that. We're revising our forecast, so I don't have the new numbers. Nevertheless, it's still better than last year. And you talked about how do we uh, make trade contribute more. We, we are quite optimistic on that contribution because there are some bright spots in trade. We've got digital, we've got services growing. Actually, services grew for the first nine months of last year at an annualized rate of about 9%. And within that, digitally delivered services growing very, very fast. We're also bullish about green trade uh, over the past two decades, green trade has tripled to about 1.9 trillion. So I think services, digital trade, green trade, these are some of the areas uh, that we need to look at. So what should we do? On in the investment side, we are negotiating an investment facilitation agreement at the WTO with 110 countries. The idea is to help developing countries as much as possible, sweep away those barriers so the investment can come in and it can help revitalize uh, um, uh, growth and, and trade. Um, we're also looking at rules to underpin digital trade um, and uh, we hope that at our 13th ministerial we'll be able to advance on these fronts. So yes, we are worried, but remember trade is very resilient and we are optimistic we can pick up on some bright spots. Let me leave it there. Thank you. And uh, the um, trade wars and uh, protectionism and new tariffs and all that, has that calmed down a bit or, or is it really a big threat still? Well, we have, we are worried about protectionism, of course, and unilateral actions. As you know, the WTO has the rules that underpins the world trading system and 75% of world trade happens on WTO terms. That is significant. So we certainly want to keep away from any measures that are unilateral uh, peer protectionists. We are seeing an increase in export restrictions and prohibitions, import restrictions uh, climbing, but we are also, um, you know, by making this transparent, our members are also seeing that we need to pull back on this. Uh, and, and so that we can have a free, a free, without a free flow of trade, I don't think we can recover. So we are concerned, uh, but we are working on it. Does industry policies keep you up at night? <laughs> it does. Look, on a pragmatic level, we have to accept that due to the vulnerability of supply chains that we saw, there will be some amount of reshoring for certain supply chains that have been over-concentrated and where we are over-dependent on certain geographies. But what we have to say is this is a slippery slope. So let's be careful, because once we start working on that, then having been a cabinet member for a long time, you know, I can come up, I can tell you how education is important to national security, health certainly is important, uh, other areas. So we need to be careful where does this stop. Uh, so pragmatism married with a keen eye to not undermine the, comp the, co the uh, open trading system and competition. I think that's what we're looking for. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ngozi uh, Haldun Mubarak, uh, the CEO of Mubadala Investment, one of the largest sovereign wealth funds uh, in the world based in the UAE. Uh, UAE is really a major uh, trading nexus uh, and you rely on a lot of trade and open economies and you also invest uh, your taxpayers' money for the future and uh, you follow the geopolitics and also the geoeconomics very closely. And uh, how important is trade and uh, openness, uh, investments for you in your calculations and how how is your outlook uh, for trade moving forward? And the UAE is even uh, hosting the next uh, trade minister meeting in February. So congratulations on that. So we hope that is as successful as COP28. <laughs> More. More. <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to work on it. Um, so I think maybe I'll start with WEF. I was here, I mean, I've been here coming for many, many years. And I will go back to... 
2019 or 2020, because I think that was an interesting inflection point. When we were talking about um, globalization, trade, the world was going in a trajectory of globalization and trade until 2020. And then I think a lot of things happened over the last four years that have moved us globally away from that trajectory. COVID, obviously, and the pandemic uh, moved towards protectionism on supply chains, changed the thinking of how the world thinks and how countries think about supply chains and about protecting, uh, obviously, their industries. Then you had, uh, obviously, war in Europe, uh, Russia, Ukraine, and, and what that ended up spinning over in terms of commodities, uh, uh, the challenge of, of, of energy uh, in Europe uh, and commodities all around the world. Uh, and of course, that created another uh, security slash uh, supply chain slash commodity uh, reality that, again, was fighting trade and fighting globalization. You have the two largest economies in the world uh, going through uh, over the last, again, particularly over the last three years, three, four years, uh, again, a very challenging relationship. Uh, and then now you have the war in the Middle East. So you have all of these events happening, leading to a push uh, away from globalization and away from trade, which I think as a capitalist, as a, as a chief executive of, a, of an investment sovereign fund, uh, a fund coming from the UAE, that is, you know, basically uh, at the heart of trade and globalization. Our ethos, our DNA in the UAE is about trade and it's about globalization. As an investor that invests east, west, north, south, we have been operating in that domain. Now, I have to draw an analogy at this point back to the UAE. What did the UAE do in that same four-year period? On trade, I think the UAE did more trade agreements in that four-year period than any other country in the world. Uh, from trade agreements with big economies like uh, India, Turkey, Indonesia, massive trade deals, uh, bilateral trade deals, which again, uh, I think helped the UAE uh, in that shift uh, that's happening globally, positioned the UAE, I think, very, very well. And at the same time, I think we maintain, I think, a globalization push by keeping the UAE as a hub for trade and business, uh, by maintaining connectivity, investing in these large economies. And then, I think as an investor, and I come back to my point, and I'm looking at the watch because I want to stick to your rules of three minutes. We, as an investor, looking at how we can invest in that supply chain across the board, be it in energy transition, be it in technology, uh, in data centers, digital technology, digital infrastructure, and how we can help unlock this, uh, this challenge. Uh, which is a challenge from one perspective, but from our perspective as investors, a huge opportunity, which, by the way, matches very well because you are, we are doing our part in helping unlock challenges that help growth, built up demand, and ultimately, just to conclude, I think my firm or our firm belief in the UAE and my firm view also with that is with economic development comes prosperity, with prosperity comes stability, with st stability, ultimately, you have Peace. Three minutes. Thank you uh, very much. I think you deserve an applause for that one. Oh, I get an applause. Uh, you mentioned uh, bilateral uh, trade agreements, and uh, we've seen a lot more of that uh, in the last years, and also mega regional trade agreements. Do you think that that, uh, of course, it can end like in the spaghetti bowl, so it can be very complex. But at the same time, it can also inspire these nations to then uh, form coalitions that later can be formalized under the WTO. Uh, Listen, I think the way I will address this is, I think there needs a mindset. There's a, there's a mindset shift that needs to happen. Because I've seen over these last couple of years, the politics has changed globally. And I think there needs to sh somehow a shift back uh, in the mindset where uh, trade and global globalization is embraced and embraced politically, uh, where trade and globalization is supported. Uh, now, obviously, that, that means you need a bit more stability in the world. Uh, but, you know, it's a chicken and egg. There's that catch-22, what comes first? Um, I can, we can debate what comes first, but at the end of the day, it needs to happen. And, and, and my views is 
we have to push for finding avenues to, to allow back that uh, principle of trade, globalization, supply chains, bringing back trust, uh, bring, you know, putting mechanics and, uh, and frameworks in place that allow that confidence and trust to come back into the systems. Uh, that will help the world and it will help the efficiency of flows, of these flows, by the way, south, north, east, and west. This notion of uh, friendshoring um, is partly happening, at least nearshoring. We used to say uh, just in time, but now we say also just uh, in case. That's also putting a little bit more inflationary pressure uh, under this. But how, how is the UAE? Do you see, see any friendshoring to you? Are you able to navigate between the G2 and the other strong forces? Yes, I mean, listen, the UAE has to play a part. We're, we're uh, obviously, the, the world is, is very big, and, and we are, we're a country that, that has to also, uh, within the, cons the constraints of our size and our, uh, and our, lo our geography and our, uh, uh, and our region. But I think we're trying hard to, to, to do our best in that space. Uh, I think one of the areas, there's two areas we're spending a lot of time on. Uh, obviously, energy transition, and that's uh, a space which I think there's tremendous benefits for the whole world. We're investing a lot of capital in, 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 in the generational side of energy transition, but also on the supply chain aspect of it. The other, which is, I think, going to be very exciting going forward, and it's been the theme of, uh, of WEF this year, is, is AI. But I think rather than debating uh, the technology aspect of it, the, uh, you know, when are we going to get to generative AI, uh, what, it reads, what it needs in terms of compute power, uh, in terms of chip power, in terms of... I'm going to, I'm going to tackle it from a different angle, which is uh, uh, on a key component of, of how we get to generative AI, which is the infrastructure slash energy transition slash data center uh, infrastructure needed for it. The data center side, and I'm just going to spend a minute on this, today you have the global capacity, global capacity uh, of data centers built in the, uh, today is about between 55 to 60 gigawatts globally. That's it. We are in 2024. That is what you have globally. Just this space alone is going to require over the next 10 years for, for, for this infrastructure, no less than, depending on what assumptions you're going to take, 200 to 400 gigawatts. That's the range. Obviously, it's a wide range, but it's a huge range. In the bottom end of that range, 200 gigawatts, just imagine the level of investment required uh, in terms of data centers globally. And what that needs in terms of energy, and by the way, that energy, energy it's needed in, in the form of clean energy. So that's going to have to come basically from nuclear, solar, wind, geothermal. So there is an unbelievable uh, demand story that's going to be built up over the next uh, years, but not 30, 40 years. We're talking in the next two, three, four, five, ten years. And, and I think that's a very important opportunity, which, if we grasp, will help everything we talked about, globalization, because it, could, it will only work effectively in a globalization uh, perspective with countries working together, corporations and investment institutions like, like ourselves working together and being efficient. Thank you, Haldun. Uh, let me then go to Christian Freeland, Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, Finance Minister, but before that, Foreign Minister, and then we were Trade Ministers together. And, um, you know, once a Trade Minister, I think you still keep uh, on your hard disk uh, some uh, of uh, the very uh, detailed uh, negotiations. It's a very meticulous uh, industry, to put it that way. Listening to Dr. Ngozi and also to Haldun now, and the bigger picture, I, Canada is an open economy. It's a G7 economy. Um, looking at uh, trade and investments and, and revival of growth there, how important do you think it is? What are the measures we can take globally to do better, and uh, what is Canada's contribution uh, to this? And I also add those three questions, but you probably remember also Christia, she was given the task when um, Mr. Trump was president and there was a new uh, trade policies and also the renegotiations of uh, NAFTA, and uh, you maneuvered that 
through. And I guess that's a competence that is also possibly useful in the years to come. Over to you, Christian. Um, well, thank you very much, Borgay, and um, thank you for the friendship between Canada and Norway. I know you're not here in that capacity, but it's a very important partnership for us. Um, look, Borgay, you know Canada well, and Canada is an open economy. We are a trading nation. Um, we're very proud to be able to say we are the only G7 country that has a comprehensive trade deal with every other G7 country, with Valdez, with Brian, I see Taro Kono of Japan. Um, if we had a Brit here, um, with the Brits too. And we work hard to have strong trading relationships, we believe in them. It is also the case, as Ngozi and Khaldun have said, the environment in 2024 is very different than it was in 2015 when I became trade minister. And it is clear, I very much agree with how Khaldun framed it, there are sort of two dominant economic trends that have a bearing on trade and investment right now. One is a focus on supply chain resilience. And that is just a reality. After the shock that we all experienced during COVID with things shut down, our people are just going to demand a little more security in their supply chains. And then that was multiplied, as Khaldun said, by Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. And, you know, Valdis can speak much more uh, with much greater experience than I can. Um, but we all saw in particular how that really delivered a huge shock to Europe, the dependency that they had. So supply chain resilience, it's a reality. And we're all thinking about it in how we build our own trade relationships and also how we as Canada make a pitch to foreign investors. The other thing that's going on, and again, Khaldun talked about this, is this is a hugely transformative moment in the whole global economy. Uh, I think that right now we're living through a moment which is comparable only to the industrial revolution itself in terms of the energy transition and the way we need to retool all of our manufacturing. That is huge. Canada's strategy, Borgay, is to say, look at these two trends and let's see how we can use them to play to Canada's strengths. And our view is there's a lot that Canada can offer to the world in this moment. You know, we have the critical minerals and metals that you need to build a green economy. We have a lot of clean energy. 85% of our grid is already clean, and we are investing heavily in building more clean energy. We are a country that believes in manufacturing, has manufacturing know-how and capacity. And then you guys spoke about industrial policy. You know, the thing that is new about industrial policy is we are developing our economies, growing our economies at a time when we also need to accomplish the green transition. And I spoke yesterday to a very significant international business leader who is also a big investor in Canada. And he said to me, all the countries in the world need to be very careful that decarbonization does not mean deindustrialization. I thought that was an extremely smart comment, and Canada is absolutely determined that decarbonization for us will mean more jobs, more growth, more manufacturing, and we recognize government needs to play a role to make that happen. So we've set up a $15 billion government fund run by professional investors from a Canadian pension fund. And I hope you know Canadian pension funds, they're geniuses, the best in the world. So we don't have my department manage the money. Sorry, you guys are very good too. Um, and then the Norwegians are involved. Norwegians also good. not bad We're either, good. Huh? No, but like, come on, the Canadian pension funds, they're great. Um, my point is, we're, we don't have government bureaucrats invest these $15 billion. We have professional investors do it, but their job is to fill that gap 
between what, to, to really to de-risk for private capital. And that $15 billion is being invested alongside private capital to make projects work. And then we have put in place a system of investment tax credits, um, really to be comparable to the IRA. And we now have a suite of policies for the industrial transformation worth about $120 billion. So come invest in Canada. We believe that we have to hustle. Um, we think this is a moment that, you know, the cement is being poured for the new economy. And we really believe in being out there, talking to investors in the world and saying there's a lot of natural advantages Canada has, and we're going to help those advantages along with government policy. And then just to conclude, Borgay, what I'll say, I liked your introduction. I liked the way you said it's really important that trade policies work for people. And that would be sort of my final comment, speaking for Canada. Um, but really, I think this applies to the whole world. Um, as we build our economic policies, whether they are trade policies or investment attraction policies or industrial policies, at the end of the day, the question we have to ask ourselves is, will this make the life of the people I represent better? Will it create great jobs that people can build a life on and have hope and optimism for the future with? Thank you so much, uh, Christia. Uh, moving over to Valdez uh, Dombrowski, uh, Vice President of the EU Commission, uh, responsible for trade and uh, investments. Uh, EU is a superpower when it comes to, to trade. I think the single market is still the largest market in uh, the world. Some used to say it's a superpower without superpowers, but I think you've shown some more superpowers lately. You've been come a little bit more assertive, uh, also on level playing fields. And uh, there is like a hobby for some people to write off the EU. Like 2012, it was like the currency was written off. It's still the second most important currency in the world. Um, it's also Greece was going to go bust. No, it is uh, the fastest growing economy uh, in, uh, in Europe. So you have also good results to show. But what is the role of the EU in securing and shaping a trade system and trade that will contribute to recovering global growth? Uh, well, uh, 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 thank you, Jorge. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, indeed, uh, EU is uh, uh, a world trading uh, superpower. We are the largest trading uh, bloc in the world, also having one of the most uh, comprehensive network of uh, uh, free trade agreements in the world. So for the EU, uh, clearly there is a lot of stake when we discuss uh, uh, global trading system. So from EU side, we are obviously uh, committed and working to preserve a rules-based multilateral trading uh, system. Uh, clearly, uh, geopolitical uh, context is uh, changing. It's uh, becoming much more uh, conflictual. And also the risk of economic uh, fragmentation is there. Uh, but clearly, that would come at substantial economic cost. There are uh, estimates of the uh, International Monetary Fund is that if this economic fragmentation would take place uh, uh, globally, so trade focusing within uh, 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 geopolitical uh, blocks, that would have an effect on the world economy, which would be equivalent of taking uh, uh, Germany's and France's combined GDP out of the world economy. And effect unevenly distributed with uh, developing countries most negatively uh, affected. So, also from that point of view, uh, clearly uh, it's uh, important to uh, preserve this multi multilateral uh, system. Uh, at the same time, it's also visible that there is a paradigm shift from efficiency to resilience. So, there's much more, more talk about economic security, economic resilience, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, 
And there the question will be to find the right balance that all this talk of economic security and resilience does not become just a pretext for uh, protectionism, that indeed uh, the risks uh, which we are facing are addressed in a targeted and proportionate way. Uh, also, when we discuss uh, resilience, uh, uh, this example was mentioned already of the EU's uh, dependence on uh, Russian fossil fuel supplies, uh, notably natural gas uh, supplies, and which Russia tried to use after its invasion in Ukraine. So it tried to use uh, their uh, fossil fuel supplies as a, a tool of weapon, uh, kind, kind of, of manipulation and blackmail. So we had to unwind this uh, dependency, uh, which we did, but obviously it also had a substantial economic uh, cost. Uh, and now, when we are moving to the green and digital economy, it requires other inputs, it requires uh, other raw materials, uh, 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 critical minerals, and also there it's very important that we are not developing uh, uh, strategic dependencies from uh, certain uh, suppliers, but to ensure this resilience, actually, uh, it's uh, the part of the answer is uh, exactly diversification. So instead of closing down, actually uh, seeking uh, uh, cooperation and uh, cooperating with a uh, broadest range of reliable partners in the world, because resilience comes also through uh, diversification. Also, from that point of view, staying open to the world remains uh, uh, key. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's clear that we also cannot have this openness uh, for granted. We need to be able to defend our uh, 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 interests, our companies, when others are not playing by the rules, distorting the level playing field. And that's what uh, Borg already refer uh, referred to, that indeed EU's trade policy is also becoming more assertive. So we need to be able to defend ourselves, and we have developed also our own toolbox to do so, uh, should uh, uh, others not play uh, uh, by the rules. But uh, uh, to summarize, from the EU side, we will uh, act multilaterally as much as we can, but we would stand ready uh, to act unilaterally if we must. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Valdis. If you look at um, the framework we have today, the multilateral framework, and we're Dr. Ngozi is the custodian of that, uh, together with her colleagues at the WTO. Has it been more robust than you thought, or has it not been? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the multilateral trading uh, framework matters a great deal economically. Dr. Goze already mentioned the figures that 75% uh, of the world trade is taking place under WTO rule. Uh, EU, as I said, has one of the most comprehensive networks of free trade agreements. Still, most of our trade is done under WTO rules. So therefore, uh, it's uh, clear that we need to invest and engage in preserving and strengthening this multilateral system, and that's uh, 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 something from the EU side we are very committed to do. We have been working uh, very intensively towards uh, successful outcomes at the 12th WTO ministerial uh, uh, conference and uh, preserving this uh, multilateral system, and we managed to do so together with all our uh, partners and under leadership of Dr. Gozi. And now uh, we must do the same. We must engage very seriously towards successful outcomes of uh, 13th ministerial conference next month in uh, Abu Dhabi to preserve this uh, multilateral trading system. Thank you, uh, Brian Monian, uh, the chair and CEO of Bank of America, one of the largest financial institutions uh, in the world. And I guess also for Bank of America uh, trade, and uh, growth is incredibly important. Uh, at the same time, we are also in a situation where we haven't seen so much global debt since the Napoleonic Wars. The global debt is now 300% of the global GDP. So uh, there's also challenges. And I think the only way to get out of that trap is also to revive growth. And that is best done uh, with uh, trade and investments. Uh, what's uh, your take on that? Do you agree? I think. Clearly, if you grow the pie, the mass 
and you manage your budgets a little more in line and you don't have the shocks of COVID to cause the spending, you get them back in the places they should be. And that's what we have to achieve. And because that amount of fiscal spending, which was necessary, and you could debate how much more was necessary, but a, a major part of it has caused inflationary factors around the world that are, we're still adjusting out of the system. And it's caused debt levels to get to places where they're squeezing out private activity. And as rates rise, that even becomes more problematic. So if you think about, when I listen to all my colleagues talking, just to hit some of the points, let's think about from people and let's think about it from companies, right? Because that's what we intermediate in the end of the day. And so if you think about it from consumers, the good news for 24 is that consumers in the U.S. are in pretty good shape. The consumers in the EU are in pretty good shape. And you put those two economies together, you got 45% of the world's GDP. And by the way, the Gulf countries are in pretty good shape and the oil prices have stayed solid. So you can start adding chunks. That means you're going to have a reasonably good year. The people are employed and they're spending money and the growth slowed down but it's slowed down more consistent with a low inflation economy. So now I'm a company. I've got to supply into that. I've got to get my materials. My consumers are demanding price reductions. Where do I get that? Well, you go back to the old places where the production is the most efficient. What we traded for decades was efficiency in dollar, you know, dollar spent, you, you, euro spent or whatever to get the goods in. And the consumers benefited by that and they're just as demanding. I want that bike back to the old price. I don't want the inflated price. I want that car, whatever. So I think that powerful consumer is going to assert itself. So when businesses go to fill it, they either just take a margin hit or they've got to drive pricing through the system, which means they go to efficiency. The mistake in all that is we can't forget the lessons of the pandemic, which is the trade for 10% price with no resiliency in supply chain had a bunch of companies saying, I can't get it. Not that I can't get it at a price. I just literally can't get it. And they've learned from that and they've change and that what they've done is this is risk management. You call it resiliency, you call it different words, but it's about risk management. Even as a lender to a company, you are very deep into where's your supply chain coming from and how resilient it is. Somewhere in March, once we figured out that COVID was transmitted by, by breathing and we needed masks, it was like a spy novel to get the mask out of China. We had to get 10 million masks out so we could open our branches. So, because we used 2 million a week, we had 400,000 total in the company. So, and they were nowhere. And so the idea is something that's commodity, this isn't something really sophisticated, a surgical mask became impossible to get and you were paying multiple dollars per unit. Um, and so th we learned from that. And that resiliency question is gonna cause a near shoring, friend shoring, multiple second sourcing, all these words described, it's a pretty simple question. I can't rely on a single source. Same thing with Germany with their energy because factors can disrupt. And so I think that is in companies' minds they won't forget, but they're gonna be up in 24 against this, you know, Wage growth has slowed and against this pressure from the consumers saying, give me price, just when they're trying to diversify supply chain. Two other points to think about in trade. The discussion around people in trade generally has been around labor, and I think the USMC and the agreements have, have dealt with this over the years. But we forget the other side of the people is the people who actually consume. And so you've got to be careful of that balance. And that's one of the tougher things because we want to all have manufacturing jobs but they're still a small part. And when you get to digital economy, this all gets completely scrambled, right? And so, you know, you cannot function. You, computers, phones, chips, they are the wheat and protein of the economy now. And so you have to get those distributed in the world. You can't, have, so you have the security side, people understand that, but from the broad side, it has to be free flowing. You can't make them everywhere. It's too sophisticated. So we have to think about trade as the way it facilitates development in countries in the global south. And without trade, you're not going to get there. Then you go to investment. And the thing I hear from companies over and over again, and Christian and I were talking about a specific case of which our, company benefit, our country benefited by, it's all about speed of execution, permitting conditions of doing it. The money is there. The money is ready to be invested. As you think about these second sourcings, new places to put a battery plant, new places to put a car plant, new places to put some sort of manufacturing facility. It's all about how fast can the government accommodate the deployment because on a just transition, we need so much stuff. And, and governments forget that you can have all the IRA money you want without the permitting it won't get spent. You can have all the different accommodations in Europe that are made without permitting it doesn't get spent. And that is really hard because you think trade's hard between two countries. Now you go through all the local jurisdictions. Seven years for a windmill. They aren't going to get up very fast. That creates financing. So we need to think about 
restrictions locally as intra-company trade is almost as important now. And even between companies part of the same you know, trading block, for lack of a better term, USMC, you can bid against them just by pace. You don't even have to worry about benefits. And so we need to think about that impact too. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for that very thoughtful um, input. It's unbelievable, like the time is out, but uh, I, I would have liked it to continue. Uh, but I, I would like then to come back to you, uh, Etsy and uh, Dr. Angosa. It seems like we're moving into a little bit higher inflationary territory because we will not go back to the system where we only looked at uh, the um, uh, competitive advantages and we bought it wherever it was cheapest. And there is the level playing field thing coming in. It's uh, also a bit of the diversification. But then there is another factor that is coming in, and this is uh, generative AI, as Haldun also mentioned. We have numbers at the World Economic Forum showing if you implement this, you can have productivity gains of 30%. So that productivity gain can, of course, then maybe adjust a bit from this. So please comment on that. And then the spaghetti bowl, and uh, are you positive to all these bilateral trade agreements and regional ones? Do you think you can like grab them and put them into your machinery um, and make them multilateral after some time, or are there impasses. And you are also very innovative when it comes to plurilaterals. If you haven't heard about plurilaterals, it is like uh, coalition of villains that go forward, 60, 70 countries, and then they hope for it to be then authorized under your auspices after some time. Two minutes for you. <laughs> well, before I want to uh, build on some of the excellent points that have been made by the panelists before commenting on this. There is one aspect. Uh, Christian said we're at a moment in time, and Aldun said the same thing. There's something we need to remember as we're at this moment in time where countries feel challenged. And that is that we need to think of globalization not in the way it was done before, but differently. And we need to make sure that those who did not benefit during the first round benefit this time. The reason globalization got a bad name is some poor people in rich countries were left out, and poor countries or developing countries were at the margin. We don't want to repeat in the new paradigm the same story where in diversifying supply chains and rejigging the way we do business and building resilience, we leave out a set of countries at the margin. So I must speak up for developing countries. We, we have to... Uh, we, fortunately, we have a paradigm at the WTO that will help us do this. We believe very strongly that we can both diversify supply chains and build resilience. And Valdi said it very well. And I'm, I'm, you know, I want to pick up on some of that. We can diversify our supply chains, deconcentrate those sectors and geographies that are post, po, uh, causing a problem by diversifying them also to developing countries, other parts of the world that have the right business environment. And we're calling this re-globalization. So you can, yes, inevitably you can re, uh, reshore some, nearshore some, but please let us also diversify some supply chains, build them in developing countries, help to create jobs. They don't have the fiscal space to be able to subsidize and have a very robust industrial policy. But in investing in critical minerals and clean energy, we can also build supply chains in these countries. And what Europe is planning to do now in investing in Africa, for instance, in these areas, this is very, very important. So that's the first point. Don't forget the developing countries. So that being said, um, I think that um, trade uh, is going to be instrumental, no matter what you do, we do, as you said, uh, um, uh, Borge, in, in the rebound. And in doing it, the generative AI, you said I should comment on it, I think this is a very important tool that can reduce the cost of trade, make supply chains more efficient uh, to manage, um, and, and, and increase productivity. So we see it in a positive way, uh, as a positive force that can help us 
uh, in, in trade and in managing supply chains better. And actually, um, if you think about it, what we need are good rules. Because there's one thing you need for AI is data. Large amounts of data to train large language models. So who controls the data is going to have the power to build the sharpest AI models. And at the WTO, we are engaged now in trying to build the rules to underpin digital trade. And that includes what building rules around cross-border data, uh, data flows. So I think that um, if we succeed in bringing consistency and agreement in the way we manage data across the board, AI, we will have a, a, a more common approach to AI that will benefit everybody. Let me end by saying it's all about people. I really want to agree with that. At the end of the day, whatever we need to do in trade, we need to remember that the agreements we reach, the supply chains we rebuild, must be to serve people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi. We're so privileged to have you uh, in that role. It's not the easiest one, to put it that way, but it's uh, very important. I feel so privileged that I could uh, moderate this excellent uh, panel. I found every intervention so thoughtful, and I think, uh, I hope you feel the same. I learned a lot, and um, I think we can make the conclusion, as in the title, no recovery without a trade and investment recovery. Thank you very much. <laughs>